Alright guys, welcome back to F1 News. Major regulation changes are coming to Formula 1 in 2026 and big updates over the last couple of days as to what exactly they're going to contain. It seems like DRS is going to become a thing of the past. A brand new mode spotted known as the override mode that may well replicate what push to pass is currently in IndyCar. What other changes are they cooking up behind the scenes? Very much on Twitter, your thoughts in the comments below. Hit the like button if you enjoy. Subscribe if you're new as always, I greatly appreciate it. First of all, lots to say on the driver market. Here's Dano Ricciardo. Has he lost his touch? How long should will give him to prove that he hasn't. Look, let's be real. Unless Yuki Tsunoda is the greatest racing driver to ever walk the planet, I think Yuki's very good. But unless he is an absolute dominant force, then Ricardo isn't the driver that he once was. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to get booted out mid-season. This was actually a talking point we had before the year even started, that Ricardo is a massively important commercial property and asset to the team, let's be real. So his value is reportedly very important to VCarb, who, I mean, they literally are just a marketing entity at this point. The car is okay this season, it's taken many parts, of course, from last year's RB19 and the Red Bull progress that they have made. But nonetheless, I mean, Visa, Cash App, Red Bull, or Racing Bulls, that's what it is, right? Let's be real. And even look at the helmets. Everything about that team, the way that it was even revealed, screams it's here for the most possible amount of money they can make. So having Ricardo there as the asset that he is surely just makes a lot of sense. So there's reason to believe that they wouldn't just get rid of him for no good reason, right? Getting rid of Ricardo, putting Lawson into the car, that is probably a decision that Helmut Marco would make. He wants to put the guys in the car that have the best choice or best chance to actually be a good choice and deliver results going forwards and be the next potential Red Bull driver. If they don't think Ricardo is that guy anymore, then Helmut Marco is probably of a mind to get rid of him. Christian Horner, though, may see things differently. He's boys with Ricardo, but also if Danny Rick is still massively important commercially to the team, then I think they would have a difficult time getting rid of him. So this is why that internal power dynamic at Red Bull is very interesting, because my feeling is that Marco would very much be in favour of uh, making a change in that situation. Horner might feel differently, and Horner, we think, has the power he also seemingly has the power to make a change with regard to the second seat at Red Bull, or maybe the first seat if Verstappen was to somehow leave. But the discussion has been around Carlos Sainz. He has been warned not to join Audi, because if you do join, you're basically writing off 2025, which is true, but maybe you are if you join Mercedes as well. The reality is, you want to join Red Bull, realistically speaking, if the option is there. Depending, I suppose, on how you feel as a driver, we believe that Lando Norris has had the chance to go to Red Bull a couple of times now. Horner was interested, the deal potentially was there to be done, but his thoughts were, Norris's thoughts, that his better chance of winning a championship is not to go to Max's team and try and beat him in his team, but instead create his own team that can compete. And that is probably a sensible idea, but nonetheless, the best car is the Red Bull. If you've got maximum confidence in yourself that you can challenge a Verstappen, best driver in the world as it stands, certainly in Formula 1, in that car, then you go for it. And I'm sure that Carlos Sainz would go for it, and I'm sure that ha probably Hamilton and Alonso would go for it if the opportunity arose. Now, there has been talk as well for Motorsport Week here that maybe Aston Martin makes a lot of sense, and there's a couple of reasons why they might be an attractive prospect. But basically, the article says Mercedes is a stopgap for Antonelli and who knows where Mercedes are and Red Bull do you want to go into the lion's den but there's more to it than just the Carla Sainz side there's also of course the Red Bull side would they bring in Sainz a driver with some you know history of conflict with Verstappen of course they were together at Toro Rosso and were a very solid driver pairing back then and certainly would be once again today we know that Sainz Senior and Jos Verstappen effectively Verstappen Senior they don't see eye to eye necessarily and if you were to bring the Sainz entourage in a alongside the Verstappen entourage, that would cause conflict in the same way that Horner's apparent wish to sign Fernando Alonso, or at least very much interested in getting Alonso into that team next year, either alongside Max or without him, Again, you bring Alonso in, you're asking for trouble. But maybe that's actually the point, because the feeling has been now for some time, well, why would Red Bull put somebody that isn't a Perez next to Max? Because, you know, Max can just easily beat Perez. They've got the greatest car, so they're in a great position. Max loves the situation he's in, I imagine, with the team at Dynamics they presently have, as certainly does Jos Verstappen. However, Red Bull and Horner may see differently. Horner is seizing power within Red Bull, as we presently understand. Maybe it would be quite the move to effectively say to Max, yeah, I'm not going to play by your rules anymore, what your entourage would like. I'm making my decisions. And the reality is that our car is so good that we could win with a driver that isn't you. So I'm going to call your bluff. If you want to leave, you can leave. If not, then fair enough. But your 
still going to be alongside another competitive driver. And if you do leave, that's fine. I've got backup options. So this is where things get interesting and early at Red Bull, right? And I wouldn't be surprised if Horner was to make a move like that, because I don't believe that he will look to kowtow at all to the way that the Verstappens, as it were, are potentially trying to run things at Red Bull. We know that him and Jos Verstappen don't see eye to eye. And would you be surprised if he says, yep, Carlos and Sainz Senior, come on in and uh, let's uh, have that drama internally. And he feels like maybe as Christian Horner, he'd be the winner of all that at the end of the day, if the car, of course, is still there. So I'm not sure the kind of old idea, maybe not an old idea, but the idea that Red Bull wouldn't put a driver that would be competitive with Max. Do I think Sainz would beat Max over a season? No, but put a good driver that is competitive and feisty and believes he can beat Max and is willing to do what it takes to try and beat Max in that car and become a world champion. I don't think it's so clear anymore that Red Bull wouldn't do that. I think there's a few reasons based on what's happened over the last few months that they actually might. Speaking of Horner though, I didn't want to mention this as like the entire video just because it's coming from Business F1 magazine and we know they have a rather sketchy track record over even let's say the last six months. But going back to this whole internal investigation, you guys remember when the lawyer was called in to write this massive report on Christian Horner, feed it back to the Austrian side of the business, and the feeling was, yeah, this is Horner dusted, 150-page, 200-page report. He's got all the details in there of all the allegations and all the text messages and the pictures and the photos and all of this stuff, and it felt like, yeah, that's probably going to be done and dusted for him. Then there were rumours that this lawyer had, like, just disappeared and gone on vacation or something just before the report was due to to be kind of had it in. It was absolute chaos. Now, however, Business F1 Magazine are reporting in. I don't subscribe to it, so I don't know. You can see the first 14 pages for free, but the entire 36-page edition for April is obviously paid for here, but Formula Passion are actually reporting on what was said, and they say the following. So Business F1 Magazine investigated the tip-off on the lawyer not being independent. This is the point, that this independent lawyer that came in to manage the Horner situation was apparently very much so not independent. And I feel like anyone with a brain looking at it, you might have come to that conclusion yourself, but this is what they're saying. They reveal the name of the lawyer in question and his law firm, an individual that seems over 70 years of age, with great experience in business matters and mergers, acquisitions, insolvencies and disputes. The peculiarity is he is the legal representative and the London lawyer of the Yavidya family, 51% owners of Red Bull. The study of him makes no secret that he's working for Yavidya. So the implication is, and as I say, I don't know if this is true it's speculation they've got a question of reputation on reporting on this story and others but just take it as it is that the lawyer had apparently been effectively hired by Yavidya to clear Horner's name and in fact apparently they say in fact I mean okay <laughs> in speculation the report of around 200 pages contained only a minimal part of the employee's complaints and magnified the results achieved by the team principal at the helm of Red Bull Racing so um, it seems like then the Austrian side of the business received this report and realized well there's not much we could do about this Horner is a Effectively going to be acquitted. So the idea that they brought in an external lawyer, completely independent, to look into this Horner case from a level playing field, well, may not have been the case, but maybe we probably knew that one already. There are, however, big interesting questions on track, especially going into Japan next weekend. Rebel have actually said with Christian Horner that, yeah, we need to improve on these front-limited circuits. The Rebel's going to be fast everywhere, but these front-limited tracks, such as Australia, that were heavy on the graining because the tyre compounds and the way the tarmac is designed did seem to make them struggle more so than Ferrari. So once we get more evidence around tracks like Suzuka and certainly China, I think it's going to be very interesting how that's going to play out some of those sectors well some of its rear limited some of its front limited you know sector one that uh, kind of curvy first couple of corners will be interesting to see how the relative cars perform there because the Ferrari should be good in that series of corners and that's all the discussion from Ferrari however they do say there is more work to be done Sainz has basically said they're not going to be able to compete with Red Bull yet until their major upgrade but all of a sudden the feeling is that Ferrari it seems then actually maybe they can get at Red Bull and maybe that optimism will be wiped away by Verstappen winning by 30 seconds in Suzuka, which may well still happen. But their feeling is that they're closer maybe even than they thought they would be. Of course, they won in Australia because of the Verstappen DNF. They might have won anyway. We don't have the answers to that. Based on Perez's pace, we can make some assumptions. But science has said that, yeah, once they bring their major upgrades, they're bringing some things we think to Japan. Their big upgrade is due for Imola, we believe, which makes a 
lot of sense for various different reasons. That is meant to be like a brand new car in some sense. And interestingly enough, Ferrari had gone from a team where I think the fan base had not much hope that they would bring upgrades that would work to all of a sudden having a history of doing so over the last several months. Certainly last year's Japan upgrade was a massive big deal for them and a step forward when usually that's not the case for Ferrari. In addition from Formula Uno, they were discussing that there are way more names coming on board. So GES, Gestione Sportiva, or whatever exactly it stands for, it kind of refers to Ferrari and Maranello and the factory, and it's a little bit confusing for those that aren't really in the weeds of that, what that actually means and what that acronym refers to, or acronym refers to. And it's also not, you know, GES, it never really screams Ferrari in the same way that SF does. So actually what they're reporting is that the GES name is going to disappear and now it will be only known as SF or the Scuderia or Scuderia Ferrari. And effectively, the feeling is that this is because more people, they want to identify better with those that may want to come and work for Ferrari, of which there may be many, because this is what was said at the bottom of the article. The choice is dictated by renewable internal communications. Moreover, there are and will be new key figures entering from the competition. So it's believed that a more immediate and more closely identifying jargon with Scuderia Ferrari makes sense. So, yeah, there's more coming on board. You know, there's lots to talk about. Loic Serra from Mercedes. Maybe they can get a deal done with Adrian Newey. That, of course, has been a big question. They seemingly want that to occur. Whether he would agree is another question. But um, yeah, they will have more names joining. So Ferrari are bolstering their team, no doubt. And maybe they will be the best setup team for 2026. That's when Lando believes that teams will actually be able to challenge Red Bull. His feeling is that to really shake things up, you've got to wait until 2026 at this point. But with the 2026 cars are going to be drastically different to the cars of today in some aspects. They will look rather similar. They will be ground effect cars. They will be hybrid cars. They will still be very large. But some of the features on the cars are going to be significantly different and that's what we are going to discuss right about now. So the cars in 2026 are going to be, I think, 20 centimeters shorter which isn't much, but it's something. They're going to be 10 centimetres thinner, I suppose, as it were, from the front-on angle, which is something, again, and potentially 30 to 40 kilograms lighter. So that's the plan. I would love a world in which they'd go back to what cars we had back in, you know, 2012. And there were other reasons why 2012 was great. But to me, that era, maybe just because I grew up in that era, really, but that era was you know, pretty damn good, I would say, in terms of where the regulations were. Small, agile cars, not as much dirt air as there is today, Many other reasons made those, uh, you know, that era kind of good. And maybe there's some rose tinted glasses in play. I will admit that. But the things I just mentioned, we've known now for some time. But a few days ago, they actually added some updates. So basically updated the technical regulations published a couple of days ago now, looking at especially on the power unit side of things. So right now we have an 860-ish, 850-ish horsepower generating internal combustion engine and a roughly 150 horsepower hybrid unit for 2026 that's going to be 500, 500. Bigger battery, effectively, it's just going to be the MGU-K. I don't think there's any going to be any more MGU-H recovery from the heat size. So a few changes, but that's been known for a long time. And there's been lots of discussion whether that's good or bad. You guys know my opinion. I'd like to go back to ICEs with sustainable fuels. And maybe that'll happen in 2029 or something like this. But the big talking point has been around the changes to the DRS and the way the cars are meant to overtake. Because we know that it's not great right now. Even that race in Australia, Verstappen was out of the Grand Prix. Was it massively entertaining? Okay, there were a few things to look for, but let's be real, that race was largely just cars in two by two formation, Noah's Ark, driving to the finish line. The dirty air has got worse year on year for the last several years. The cars are massive, they're so heavy, and um, there's just so many reasons why they're problematic. We've talked about the tyres a few weeks ago as well. But the overtaking aids that Formula One added with DRS, you know, well over a decade ago now, have remained until the present day. The feeling is, should DRS stay or should DRS go? We we also have the overtake button, right? The energy deployment where the drivers can choose to deploy that 160 brake horsepower from their battery or whatever it is if they choose to. And typically they'll choose to employ it when trying to overtake another car on track, right? Or to defend from another car at some point. That will probably remain. But the feeling is there's now going to be an additional version of that which may replace DRS entirely. So Formula One has had DRS, the rear actuator flap opens at the back, enabling an extra 15 plus kph depends on the track you're at to allow you to overtake 
Most people don't really like DRS because it's a bit cheesy. Sometimes the overtakes are done way before you go to the end of the straight. And in an ideal world, the DRS helps you go for the move, but it doesn't like guarantee you the move being done. IndyCar have a feature called push to pass where there's a certain amount of time per race where you're allowed to press the button and deploy extra energy. During that period, you can, you know, basically get extra brake horsepower to try and pass the car in front or to defend. So it's strategic. You only get a certain amount of utilization through the entire race. And if you misuse it, then you've wasted it. So it's not like DRS where you can use it every single lap to, you know, stay in a DRS train or whatever. That doesn't really occur. So Molly Marissa here put together a fascinating thread. I'll leave a link down below if you guys want to check out the entire thing. There's more to say on this than just the ERS override mode DRS replacement. But this is what I really wanted to hone in on. So there's something called override mode, which has now been written into the regulations, but override mode is not said anywhere else. So this is something that has been put into the regulations, but is not yet in the sporting regulations. So basically it sounds to me like this is something that is coming soon. They're still writing it in what they want to describe this as. So this feels like a push to pass-esque feature. The way this is defined is as follows. So from 290 kph to 340 kph, the energy deployment from the hybrid unit, the electrical side, will gradually decrease. So once you get to 345 kph, which is, you know, let's say 213 mph, something like that, 340 I think is about 211 miles per hour, something to that effect anyway. So speeds that the cars do reach in Grand Prix situations, certainly with, um, well, DRS open, but that may not be the case any longer. So pretty much as you get faster and faster, the energy deployment you are allowed from the hybrid power unit goes down. This I think is to stop what Verstappen and Horner and Red Bull complain about. Now let's say down the Monza straight, by the time you get to the end, if you're using all of your ICE, your combustion, and all of your electrical power to get up to top speeds, by the end of the straight, you'll have run out of juice in the battery. So I think the point is that as you get faster and faster, the amount of energy you're allowed to deploy gets lower and lower, so that that phenomenon doesn't really occur. Once you get to 345 kph, you get no more power from your MG you, your motor generator unit, right, basically the electrical side. However, override mode instead means you get no drawing power until 337 kph, at which point there is then a decreasing linear rate to zero kilowatts after that. And there's also discussion here as to exactly how this differs from current overtake modes, because overtake mode overrides energy deployment maps, whereas this overrides the entire energy map. So this is a different mode, and it does sound like something that isn't the normal overtake mode we currently have, the overtake button, the ERS deployment, it's something, or the curs as it was known way back in the day when it first came in, whereas now we're going to get this override mode, which allows you effectively to deploy more energy than you otherwise would be able to, because as it describes here, in override mode, you can use more electrical deployments than you usually would be able to. So you're allowed to use all of this kilowattage up to 355, and then it goes down to zero, or at least up to 345, then it kind of decreases linearly to zero. So I think that actually makes a fair bit of sense that if you want to use the override mode, the push to pass, as people might describe it as, you can unlock probably another 10 kph by using such and well if you use it appropriately and strategically then you can gain some advantage. So override mode as like an extra element of power that you can put on top of what you normally can that feels like a push to pass-esque feature to me and quite probably will replace DRS. This has been the theory now for some time that DRS people don't really like it they want to get rid of it and this override mode may well replace it in part but also general discussion on active aerodynamics there's been a theory, I don't know if this is going to be true, but the theory goes that they're going to have something on the front wing or on the car in general that allows the driver behind or the driver in front to gain or reduce their downforce they're allowed to aid overtaking. The idea would be that instead of opening DRS, let's say, to allow the driver behind to get closer on the straight, they would find a way to either reduce the downforce of the car in front or increase the downforce via active error of the car behind so that dirtier wasn't so much of an effect they could follow closer through the corner and therefore DOS wouldn't be necessary to get the move done, especially with the addition of the override push to pass mode. So that's kind of my read on it as it stands. We don't have the full information yet. 
But the theory has gone now for some time that they want to get rid of DRS. And this information and the updates to the regulations over the last couple of days says to me that, yeah, probably they are going to get rid of DRS. Whatever they replace it with, whether it's active aero, whether it's active suspension, which many people would certainly like to see as well, because that can have other benefits. And this push to pass little feature, that very much so remains to be seen. But very much on Twitter, your thoughts on all this stuff in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new. Take care. And I'll see you next time.